Hey, John Cristani here, and I'm going to have some real talk with you. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a topic uh, people have asked me to talk about, but I haven't mentioned too much, which is my house burning story. What happened was I was actually at a uh, entrepreneur event for my entrepreneurs organization, the night of the fire. I was in West uh, area called West Lake Village. My house is in Malibu, so I was actually at this event that was only about 20 minutes away from my house at the time. It was a year-end or year-ish end party for entrepreneurs in the LA area. Everybody's making over a million dollars a year, so there was. I don't know, maybe like a couple hundred people there. You know, all business owners, successful business owners, restaurant owners, you know, industrial machine shop owner, you know, all sorts of businesses, car dealership owners, all sorts of business owners. And we're all there and there were some, some speech things during the day which are kind of boring and then, you know, we're all getting together and having drinks at the bar at uh, the Four Seasons down there in Westlake uh, when the fires really started glowing up. And we ended up having to get evacuated because the smoke was coming in and we were supposed to stay there that night, all of us entrepreneurs, um, but we had to get evacuated. Now, I ended up getting in my truck and driving home. I had a couple drinks. I wasn't, you know, over the limit, you know, I'm sure. You know, I drove home and the, fi the smoke was just, there was a lot of smoke in the air because it was all blowing. The winds were about... I don't know, something like 60, 70 miles an hour, and they were all blowing the fires from eastern Los Angeles over to our area, which is in Malibu. And so the smoke was all filtering there, but I didn't think the fires were that close. Um, now, I drove home. The fire people had said, we don't advise you go home, but the fire hasn't crossed the freeway yet. And I was like, it's not gonna cross the freeway. I've, I'd only lived in my house three months at this point, okay? Maybe not even three months. We had just bought this great Malibu ranch. It had horse stables. We had a big backyard right up against the mountain. We, we didn't have any horses yet, but we had a you know, tack shed. We had a horse arena. We have a nice amount of land in a beautiful part of uh, LA, you know, Malibu. And so I said, oh, it's gonna be fine. It's not gonna cross the freeway. The freeways, you know, it's 14 lanes. It's huge. The freeways, you know, the freeways in Los Angeles are, are just, they stretch, you know, they're freaking big. So I thought the fire can't go all the way over that. And there's businesses on each side. It's not gonna go over the freeway. You see where it's going though. <laughs> now, the good thing was my wife and my daughter, I only had one daughter at the time, were, they were staying at about an hour away from where we lived. They were staying an hour away, not because we got into like an argument or anything. She had work. She still hadn't transitioned her work. I mean, she has clients. She sees them one or two days a week out in a different area of Los Angeles. So she was still seeing her clients. So she stays out there when she has work to see her parents. So it was me and the animals alone in my house. Fell asleep. And as I said, I had a couple drinks. So I was like, oh, I'll just go to sleep. I'll evacuate in the morning if I need to. And I thought to myself, it couldn't happen to me. What are the chances that a fire actually burns down my house? Like, what are the chances of people who get hit by, like, their houses burned down by a wildfire? It's not going to happen to me. I just, I just thought the odds were too crazy, okay? So what ended up happening was I woke up. My alarm was going off on my phone because I, I had set my alarm for... I don't know, 8.30. I hadn't, I hadn't said it when I went to sleep. I just, it, 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 it had just rolled over by accident from the day before that uh, my alarm was set for 8.30. And I woke up and I, I snoozed my alarm and I was like, I don't want to get out of bed. And I remember looking outside and I was like, oh, the sky's a funny color. It's kind of like orangey reddish. And I was like, oh, that's just the, you know, the soot, the smoke blows this way and the sun shines through the smoke. It's going to look weird. I didn't think, you know, I thought the fire was still miles away. Now, it all got a little weird when the whole world went black for a second. I was lying in my bed and everything just went black. And even with, I don't know if my eyes were half open or it was just black. And I was like, oh my God, what just happened? 
and I look outside, I'm like peeking out of my bed, and then finally I get up and I look out and I realize a tree, a burned tree had just collapsed and the ashes and the soot and the blackened bark and all that blackened stuff, when the tree collapsed, had rose up in a black cloud and blotted out the sun. I was like, oh my gosh, the fire was within maybe a hundred yards, okay? But it was that close where the soot of this blackened the whole sky and it was a tree in my neighbor's yard. And I thought to myself, holy, you know, like, God, you know, just every swear word you can think of because the fire was literally right there and it was raging. I'm talking hundred foot flames because the trees, the trees were 40, 50 feet tall, sycamore trees. And the flames, flames always go up two to three times what the actual like height of something is. So the flames were a hundred feet in the air and I'm looking out, you know, one tree had just collapsed. I was just freaked out. I was like, oh my gosh, it's in our neighbor's backyard. Our yard, some of the horse areas were on fire at the very ends of our property. It was that close and it was raging. We're on, I'm talking, we're on a hill. So the fire is downhill from me. So it's burning up. The brush was about 15 feet high in this stream, the chaparral, the kind of twigs and bushes. And then the trees were, you know, they all are along the stream bed. They're about 30, 40, 50 feet high. And it was just burning up this stream, coming straight for our house. And the winds were blowing hard. And I realized I have no time to take anything with me. I have to get out now. And the fire was raging. You could feel it from my bedroom. So in that moment, well, I had to make decisions of what to bring. First, first thing was put on my clothes. <laughs> okay, I was like, I have to put on clothes. I can't, you know, I can't just run out of my car like this. And then the second thing was, you know, I need my phone to call people. I need my wallet. You know, I just need my driver's license. You know, it's right next to my phone. And I need my keys to my truck to get out of here. And so that was obvious. Clothes, wallet, keys, phone. And then beyond that, I started going through a laundry list. And I said, okay, animals, my dog, my cats, and my hedgehog. Then my mind said, okay, what else should I get? I, we have some memorable photos. We have some memorable books. I have some memorable pictures. I have, you know, these, these little clay prints of my uh, daughter's foot and hand. We have all these little things, my computers, my hard drive. And I just said, screw it all. The only things that I can take with me are my animals. And I went out, it was pretty funny. I went out into my living room and, or the kitchen and the cats were waiting because they always wait to get fed. They're always, they always get fed right in the morning, right after we wake up. And I went in there and I said, Juniper Zeus. I was looking at Juniper was on the counter. Zeus is down by the tr his tray. Tried to walk up to them and I tried not to seem freaked out, but they could tell. And they were like, oh, this isn't good. He's coming to grab me or take me to the vet or something. They started running. They just bolted and they went running around the house and hiding. I was like, no, this is the worst situation because the fire's in my backyard. I have these cats that are running away from me. So I'm going to have to leave these cats to die. And I'm like, my wife's gonna kill me. <laughs> and I'm gonna die because she loves those cats. They were her pregnancy cats. The first cat, I went after the fat one first. His name was Zeus, and they're brother and sister. They're black cats. He went under the couch, right near his dish, and I grabbed a broom and I just smacked him out from under the couch. And he looked at me, and he was a little stunned. And he was like, what the heck, man? Why'd you just hit me? I'm, I'm playing. And I grabbed him, I threw him in his crate. The next one was a little bit harder to capture. Uh, her name's Juniper, and she's smaller, slinkier, but faster. So I ran, I said, Juniper, 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 come here, and she just ran under our table. Then I try to go get her. She runs into our living room. I try to go get her. She runs down another hallway, and I can't catch her. She's just running away, and she's freaked out. And the more I chase her, the more she runs. But I'm like, I don't have time to play games. 
you're gonna die. And I literally thought this cat was, I was just gonna have to leave her and let her burn to death, but I was, that would be pretty hard uh, to deal with. So the fire's coming all this while. I'm hearing stuff crackling outside. It's getting closer. Finally, Juniper runs into our bedroom and I close the door behind her and I say, okay, it's you and me. I'm gonna get you. I try to grab her, she runs under the bed. I can't reach her. I end up flipping the mattress. Try to grab her, she runs under another, you know, a dresser or something. Flip the dresser over. I flipped over every piece of furniture in there and finally she got pinned between the mattress and the ground. And I just grabbed her by her tail and I ripped her out. I must have ripped out some of her claws. She's holding onto our carpet like this. And I rip her out by her tail because I was like, if you lose a tail, just be thankful you're alive. Finally, after all of this is said and done, I get her in her crate, I get our dog, which is easy, throw him in my truck, I turn on my truck, and then I realize I forgot the hedgehog. Now, his name is Henry, and he's my favorite thing. My wife hates him, because hedgehogs are very smelly. They throw up on themselves um, to attract mates. That's how the boy hedgehogs attract females. They throw up on themselves and get their scent. And I was like, I can't leave the hedgehog. My wife would be, my wife would like that too much. <laughs> She'd be too happy to get rid of the hedgehog. And I, I, I would feel guilty, you know, he's a, he's a defenseless hedgehog. Like, you can't let a hedgehog die. So I ended up running back in, the fire's in our backyard. I run back into our house, grab his, you know, grab his box and I throw him in my truck in the back seat. There's too much smoke in the air. I think he'd die of asphyxiation outside and I drive out. And I drive around the bend and there's, there's fire, okay? There, there's, there's fire everywhere. Everywhere I look around my community, there's fire. Now my neighborhood was actually, you know, in retrospect, it was one of the hardest hit communities in entirety of Malibu because the communities in the mountains in Malibu, the great views and everything, the ones that were the most remote, I think they're the best, were the hardest hit especially my community, I think a third of all homes um, totally burned. And almost every home was affected by some sort of damage. So I'm in my truck rounding this bend and there's only one way out for me. There's no alternative ways out. There's one way I can go to get out at this point. And I get out, okay, I had to drive through a bit of fire on my way out. Houses are burning. And finally, I get to what I call fork in the road. There was two ways I could go around um, this lake to get to the main street. Now, I didn't know which way to go because there was fire over here and it was completely black. And there was fire over on the, the long way, but it was a little more clear. At first, I tried to go the short route and it was completely black. And I went down, started driving down until I couldn't, I literally couldn't see anything. It was just completely black. And I said, oop, we're turning around. And I go back. I go the long road. And literally there are branches that have fallen in the road. And at this point I'm thinking, wow. Okay, first off, I didn't want to drive over branches that were on fire. I'd never been in a fire before. So I thought my truck was actually going to, the, the tires, if I ran over fire, I thought the tires would melt and pop and I would be stuck and asphyxiate to death. I wasn't thinking, you know, my mind, but this is where my mind went. I was freaked out. Usually I'm calm under pressure, not, not, during, a, not during a wildfire. Um, I'll be better next time though. So I go take my truck down the long road and there's fires on both sides of the street it's arched over, some branches had fallen on fire, and the, I mean, there's literally fire all around, and I just said, okay, I'm turning back around, and I find a little clearing along the road. It was an empty lot, and I just park in the middle, and it's close to the lake, Malibu Lake, and I thought to myself, okay, worst case scenario, I'm diving in that lake, all of my animals are probably dying. Maybe I'll save a cat, you know, my dog and a cat or two if I, you know, am in the lake holding them just above water level. And the longer I sat in my car, the more I realized I might die anyways because I might, there's no air. I was in a valley. I might asphyxiate to death. Everything was on fire all around me. But I was sitting in my car and I made a, you know, I made a little video um, 
because I did. I wasn't sure if I was going to get out. <laughs> I was hoping maybe my phone would survive and people would get the video. It was like a eulogy. Finally, a fire a fireman in a truck. They the fire people did. You know, they they had no resources to help save our community because the fire was so big. The firefighters were stretched thin. Our community had been left to be just burned. Okay, fire people were not fighting the fire in our area. But somebody had come through in a, not a fire truck, but just like a normal kind of like Ford F-250, driving through just to see if there are any stragglers. And uh, I saw him and I started honking my horn. I got out of my truck, I went over and I said, I don't know which way to go, I think everything's on fire. He said, go that way, so that, the way he came from. And he said, you can go there. He says, although it's black and there's no visibility, just continue driving through it. So I said, okay, I'm gonna trust because you can't see, I couldn't see the road, I couldn't see anything, it was so black. There's no visibility. I got in my car and I zoomed down that way and finally I got on the main street, which is Mulholland Highway, and I was home free because they keep, the firefighters keep Mulholland Highway, which is this road that goes about, I don't know, maybe 100 miles. There's mountains in downtown Los Angeles, it goes from those mountains all the way down to the end of Malibu. It's this long highway along the very ridge line of the mountains throughout all of Los Angeles. And it's a very curvy road, very high up, and I guess the firefighters use it as their kind of like line of defense. They just make sure that road is always open, not necessarily the communities around there, but that road. So they had been defending that road and the fires were right up against it, right? You're at, a, you're at a road on the top of the mountains. And the fires are burning houses on either side, but the firefighters were making sure that the fire never shut down that road. And I was able to drive along that road. It gives me chills to this day. I was able to get out of the fire. That, that was my Woolsey fire story, and it was, it was crazy. First thing I did, all the cell phone lines had been burned, in, you know, and the power had been shut off in the community I was in, so I couldn't make calls until I got a couple miles away from the wildfire zone. I made calls to everybody and let them know I was alive. People thought I was dead. And that was one of the scariest moments of my life. It was pretty gnarly looking back on that. I came this close to dying or getting burned in a wildfire. Maybe not, you know, I don't know, but it was close. So that was my story. I wanted to share that with you because it was a dramatic moment in my life and I'm not going to share too many of these moments but uh, this channel is about you know marketing but an entrepreneurship mainly but that was a huge thing and one of the big things though that I realized after everything burned is I don't really miss any of the things that actually burned which is a weird thing looking back the only thing I miss the most is I had my whole book collection. Every book I had read since I was a child, I would always take notes in the margin. I would always write my thoughts down. And losing all of those moments in time, of all the books I read, I, I went back through my book. I'd re read through my notes. I'd just spend 20 minutes and just read through an old book just to reminisce. And losing those books were actually the most meaningful thing I missed in losing the nature. But the nature came back very fast. Nature is a way of coming back. So that's what happened during the Woolsey fire. It's my fire story. Thanks for watching.